welcome everyone to Fantasia, the amazing virtual online internet edition. It is my privilege to be presenting this live Q&A of private chat. My name is Justine Smith and I am the programmer of Fantasia Underground. Hopefully many of most of the participants uh, in the room just finished watching the film, which for me is one of the most transgressive, playful, and intimate looks at loneliness and technology that when I saw it was pre-pandemic and is now just like the movie of the moment. I'm super excited to introduce our amazing panelists who will be talking about the movie today. Uh, we are um, should be unmuted in a second, the rest of the participants, and we can get started. Um, Let's see. I don't know if I have power. Let's see. Is everyone popping up or? Okay. Yeah. Amazing. Yay. Okay, cool. So, um, I mean, let's do a round table of like introducing everybody who is in the stream. I'm going to start with the trio. Uh, we have Van Hosey is the director, the writer, the editor, and as far as I understand, the cinematographer. Welcome. Um, we also have Nikki Belfiglio, <laughs> sorry, uh, who is Emma in the movie, and I believe you also designed the poster, which like I'm obsessed with. Yeah. Uh, we have Carolyn Sheridan, who is the production designer, and that's the wonderful trio you see before you. No. Um, in window number two, we have producer Oliver David, who it's 4 a.m. in the UK, and he's still very happily joining us. So very, very happy about that. And of course, we have Peter Back, who is the star, Jack. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for being here. I'm Hi. so excited to talk about the movie. Um, I mean, I guess like we should just start off with like, how did this movie get born as an idea and how did it get from an idea to a final product? Um, so I think I wrote a script for it back in 2015, I think maybe it was 14, maybe it was 15. I don't know, but it mutated quite a bit and it really didn't start getting legs until I met Oliver, our, our Brit over here, who kind of, so British, kind of, <laughs> kind of, uh, <laughs> kind of, uh, what was a big encouraging factor and, um, yeah, we, we, we shot, we went into principal photography in January of 2018. And then we did a bunch of reshoots in 2019. So I don't know if you know this, but me and Nikki here are in a band called Bodega. And so this movie was mostly shot and edited in between tours from our band. So um, it, it's been a long time coming. So how long was the production? Well, the initial shoot was 21 days in 2018 and I think we did four days in 2019 um but I mean it's funny like I'm such a process filmmaker so I like to figure out things when we're rolling and uh which is kind of dumb when you're making a DIY movie because I would <laughs> say only probably we could have shot this movie if we had a really tight script in like eight days or something but instead we shot it in, in 25 <laughs> which is still not a lot of time not that much but yeah um yeah and i mean um i've been reading some of your blogging if that's like the way to study like tumblr and stuff and you really invoke often like personal filmmaking and do do you like do, do diy mm -hmm. um can you talk a little bit about that like ethos and how you brought it to uh private chat yeah so i think uh, I can't talk about this without talking about our, our band because what, what, what I've always tried to do is bring a punk rock band mentality to, towards filmmaking. And even when people make independent cinema, they usually do it in this totally decadent uh, way where they're even, even on the indie level, they're wasting so much money. But when you do it, you know, I don't know, for whatever reason, when you get a bunch of musicians together and you say, we're going to record this track, Almost no one asks about money because in music, there is no money. So no one is worried about money and everyone, everyone will show up and do the thing. And it's almost like a, a party is happening at the same time as the shooting. 
And so I wanted to kind of, with, with, my, with my personal films, I create a similar kind of atmosphere where people show up and most of the crew is just my friends. And, um, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to make serious work, but it's, it's much more intimate. I mean, the entire, like 90% of the movie is set in my house in the room that we're in right now. This is Jack's bedroom right here. It's also Scarlett's bedroom right here. We, we did yeah. paint this room teal and then white and then teal and then white, like <laughs> over yeah. and over again. Um, quite a good dough like experience, but um, yeah, it, 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 this is the fun stuff. Yeah, it, uh, um, I, yeah, I, I don't know what else to say, but. Yeah, I, um, and at what point did Peter get involved? Because I feel like he's so much like, embodies Jack it's like I can't imagine anyone else in the role someone who's willing to be as like vulnerable but also like chaotically I don't like I want to say chaotic good I don't know if that's like too <laughs> but like there's well, there's something in that have you, have you ever seen Peter's own movie that he directed and has a part in assholes I have not but I know like everyone at Fantasia is like insanely in love with it so like I know I have to like prioritize you should check it out. It's a pretty wild movie. But um, so I, I initially wanted Peter to do kind of like a bit part as kind of um, uh. kind of kind no offense. Of, well, I, I, not, not, not because of him, but because I thought he could pit, play a heavy pretty well, like a guy who would be antagonistic to Jack and make fun of him and stuff like that. But then I saw assholes and Peter's character in that movie is so handsome in this boyish kind of way. He reminds me of like Jean-Pierre Lowe from the Truffaut movies of the 60s and had this uh, naive enthusiasm about him, which I was like, oh wait, that's Jack. Because well, I mean, one, one thing I've learned about myself in making this movie is when I started this movie, I thought uh, we were making a really serious uh, kind of European style movie about a very alienated character who is, had a very problematic worldview, but one of the big discoveries making it was, was I discovered my own American naivete. Mm -hmm. and I, I truly believe in the fairy tale uh, to, a, to a fault, perhaps. Um, and I believe that um, you can will yourself to a better situation. Um, unfortunately, maybe, maybe that's just because I've lived in the US, but when I was making it, I thought Jack had to be a bit of a sweetheart, even though he makes some terrible choices, even though he is a bit of a creep, he's also a very likable guy and he's uniquely American and that he really truly believes that if he just dreams, his heart will, you know, get him all, get him the girl and the, and the, and the blissful life, you know? And Peter can do that. Peter can do that. Look, I mean, Peter, I feel like Peter gets typecast a lot as either like the lover dream boy or like the heavy douchebag kind of character. And, and we found the middle ground in this movie, I think. But I also want to give you a lot of credit for directing me towards the light, uh, enthusiastic <laughs> boyish, because there were some moments where I was very dark in myself, like even just came set dark. And I remember, or, and, or, or my instinct maybe was like a, a little ed, like, harder that's not to my credit i i'm just saying i think that we found that together it, mm. we, it really was a nice collaboration finding that tone and you were so correct to want to tease that out of the character because you could have played this guy a lot of well i could see another filmmaker taking him in another direction but i think the reason why this movie works so well in your hands is that you it's that enthusiasm and that hope, the naivete that you sort of throw yourself under the bus for that I think makes the character work and the movie feel worthwhile and not like just overly de depressing or something. I mean, no, I guess it's a happy yeah. end, but it's a pretty, there's a lot of, it's a lot about the movie that could be, you know. Yeah. It, it's more, yeah, anyway, I'll, I'll put a period on it. Well, it's a, it's a kind of strange thing because it's a character with a nihilistic worldview who himself actually loves people. And I, f I hope that comes across when people watch it, that there's a disconnect between what he says and what he does. <laughs> You're muted. Oh, sounding muted. Mm. Uh-oh. We can't hear you, Justine. <laughs> I start asking questions. <laughs> Peter, your hair's looking long again. 
You need, you need a haircut. I haven't cut it in a very long time. I can tell. Do you, what, how do you feel about it? You wish it were shorter? Or? I mean, you look like um, you look the like guy Jack. from Sleeping Beauty, the prince. Oh. That's good. How come I don't get this treatment? Well, to Oliver, it's back to you and I. <laughs> <laughs> it's just so unfair. <laughs> oh, I was about to say, you look like the prince, too. Thanks, Peter. Hey, hey, um, hey. We need to relay this information. Okay. Ju Justine, your mic is muted for she some knows. reason. It's no, she knows she's having trouble. Wait, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Is it, am I oh, back or no? Oh, you're back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I don't know what you happened. You were vamping. So. It was, yeah, yeah, it was, it was cool. But you guys, like, major, major improv points. Um... <laughs> What I was like, going to kind of ask about was the fact that like you're talking about like what people say versus what they do and these kind of like mm -hmm. duality and so much of the movie is also about like our online lives which often is like a projection of who we want the world to think we are. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit of how you kind of created this online world with it that is very like rooted in a very real gritty environment at the same time? Yeah. Well, when I, when I really sat down day one and, and it was like, I want to say something about my generation and our relationship to the computer, because I think it's earth shattering. We can't really see it now because we're too in the thick of it, but we're, we're really living through an extremely important historical moment. So I wanted this film to be about that. And I thought deeply about it and I thought, okay, our addiction to the dopamine that we get from social media is very similar to the, uh, the feeling you get from pornography and internet gambling. So that's where I kind of hit upon that character. And uh, I just, uh, you know, I wanted to make a movie where it, you know, it asked a big question. It's so like, you know, prostitution is a wonderful metaphor for movies. A lot of great filmmakers have used it before, like Godard, Paul Schrader, uh, both of them to come to mind, two heroes of mine. They, they always use prostitution as a metaphor because prostitution is where the thing that is the most important and sort of sacred thing about the human experience, namely love, becomes just another product that you can buy. So immediately it's like, wow, that's just a great topic. And, and cam girls are already super cinematic anyways, because anytime you talk to a cam girl, um, you're, you're become a, you become simultaneously a director and the audience, which is like a weird uh, kind of bifocal perspective where you say, okay, what I want you to do is I want you to take the cigarette. I want you to do it. I want you to, in fact, I want you to turn your head and profile and you're playing the scene too rough. Can you dial it back a little bit? And you know, your intention in this scene is to humiliate me, but in fact, you know, treat me like your cousin. I'm not, you know, some just John you picked up off the street. You know, you, you, when you uh, direct, a cam girl you're directing there's no difference and but what's amazing is that you are simultaneously the audience as well and it's extremely intimate yeah of course you know? and, i mean and there's something about like the the a lot of these scenes that are you know i guess we're in america right we're a puritanical country i want to say overtly sexual but in a way it's it's the most intimate and real you can be and i mean i think I don't know. I just I think it's wonderful to like really show it, show it in its entirety in a very real way. That's like it's it's a lot of things simultaneously at once. Yeah. Well, that that that's a nice segue because I, I was going to say that I think what people are really paying for when they pay for cam girls is they're paying for intimacy. You know, if you really just want to get off quick, you could watch any kind of video anywhere. But you there's something there's a there's an adrenaline rush and a thrill that a real flesh and blood person is on the other end of the screen which we also desperately crave right now especially yeah i mean you kind of see the explosion of only fans in the pandemic right where it's like that's become such a it's it's literally be, went from something fringe in january where like i would say like 90 percent of people had no idea what it was to mm -hmm. like all over tiktok and it's i think that the reason is is primarily that people feel so lonely mm -hmm. and it does create that kind of personal interaction mm -hmm. um, it's super interesting like your movie was made obviously well well before the situation now but it speaks mm -hmm. so much to like this current moment yeah well this current moment is not that different than our moment one year ago it's just exacerbated yeah, you know? it's like an exaggeration of absolutely everything that's going 
wrong or right in the country mm -hmm. or the world, I guess. Um, I mean, one of the other parts too that I find super, super fun and super interesting and super American is like the gambling aspect yeah. because it's not that gambling is an American thing. Like you can watch like old French movies and they're wearing like Chanel dresses, but there's something so tacky about American gambling that I think kind of translates so poetically like Las Vegas, it's maybe the most American place on earth. Um, I would love if you guys could talk a little bit about the gambling aspect of the movie as I kind mean, of like we, we actually yeah. get we actually gambled we actually we gambled spent a lot of money yeah, yeah. We yeah. lost a lot of money most of the I mean, money it actually was I have, to lose. I think I have yeah. three I have three stories that are oh, interesting you can't see that, no. that I can I can crystallize the gambling experience number one number uh, one was that researching this movie I thought I'll just do a little bit of online blackjack just to see what it's like you know I'll start with 20 bucks or whatever oh. And it's just strictly for research during the stress of production where, <laughs> you know, you know, when you're literally your own camera guy and you're directing and things are falling apart. And at the end of every shoot, I thought, well, I'll, I'll play a few hands of blackjack just to unwind, you know, and then there was one really, really pathetic night, which any gamble, any true gambler can relate to the story where probably starting around 2 a.m. I put in like, you know, 40 bucks and I lost it put another 40 bucks. Was that here lost or at it. the, at the it was, actual It's probably scene. right at this desk we're talking about. No, it was, exactly. it was online. Yeah. Okay. And before you knew it, I had lost like $400, which is super important to the budget of a movie this small. And so I was like, you know what? I'm not going to go to bed until I get this $400 back. And like literally within like, sorry, Oliver. And, and, and then all night long I was doing this and I got my $400 back. I like really played methodically, but within 30 minutes of me getting my initial winnings back or losses back people knock on the door and it's like 6 a.m and they're like we're ready to shoot you know and it's like and but it actually taught me a big lesson i was like oh this is this character this is yeah. this is this is this is pathetic and you're a fucking loser for doing this but that you like you have an insight into gambling now the second story is me and peter went went, 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 went to shoot some scenes at this casino near JFK Airport in New York that has all electronic tables. It's gorgeous. And we were trying to just steal some shots. So we had like a little DSLR. And uh, these scenes were cut from the movie because it was far too glamorous to have him at an actual casino. He, did, <laughs> he needed to be alone in his apartment. But I said, Peter, okay, here's really $100. I forget what the exact amount was, but- Both actually, put in 60. Yeah, we both put in 60. Okay, we're like, we're in this together. We're each going to put in 60. It was $120. And we're going to like actually show on the screen that you really lost $120 on this roulette spin. So I was like, Peter, pick a number you like. He goes, red 21. And he puts it on red 21. And it's like, <laughs> red 21. <laughs> <laughs> Which is insane. If you know anything about roulette, we just won like four grand. And I was like, you weren't supposed to win. <laughs> you know? you not at the cash out because they're yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, everyone from the casino started coming yeah. and being like, you need to leave, leave now. now. Yeah, Peter, leave now. Peter had to fill out a W-2. W-2, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it was incredible. So yeah. That was so much money. We both had like at least 17, it was like 1,700 each or something. Yeah. It was crazy. It's and, a lot of money for poor New York. And the, and the third story of gambling, which I'll tell you, is the story of private chat. Because anytime you get into a relation chat, it's a gamble. You, you, have, to, yeah. you have to risk. You have to put all your chips on the table. And it's very irrational. You say, <laughs> anything for you, baby, you know? <laughs> <laughs> no, baby, give me that craps, you know what I mean? <laughs> and it's uh, well, one of these lines for the poster, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> anything for you, baby. <laughs> we, also, we did the rap party at that casino <laughs> as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've never gambled more in my life. Than yeah, it was, it was a heavy that. few months. Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. yeah it's it, it, it is a bit of a rush, but don't do it, people. Kids. Well, also, cinema, kids, the kids who uh, are watching, all the kids are watching. Don't say it, man. Cinema. I, I was going to say, independent cinema is very similar to a relationship in that it's also gambling. You have to take an X amount of money and you put it on this very irrational thing that you have a vision for, and you get a, you get just like gambling, you get your ragtag crew of outlaws to go to the <laughs> casino with you, and you say, "This is we're, we're going in tonight." Are you, you, you know, you're going to count the cards, and you know, and then. 
And usually, so much, usually most people watching this, they know independent cinema usually does not pay off. I don't even mean in the money sense. It doesn't even pay off in the spiritual sense. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, all the independent filmmakers out there know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. That you double down, you throw your chips out there, and you know this movie will not play at festivals. You know this movie will not ma make back its budget. But you roll it anyway because there's something about the gambler and the, you the might filmmaker. Hit red 21. You might hit red twenty one, you know. So what keeps us going? Feels good when you do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and I mean the other part of the film too is obviously like the sex aspect and like you really go like full out there in a way that most American movies are kind of like shy about. Yeah. Um, was that something that you had to do from the beginning from your vision or was that something that like you had to well, work towards? Absolutely. I, I, this movie is about a man who falls in love with a girl and we eventually flip and, you know, get to know a little bit more about her. But for the for the first hour of the movie, you're pretty much in his head. And so I thought it'd be incredibly dishonest to make this movie and not show male genitalia. And, 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 and I have a, a personal bone to pick about the American cinema. You know, for example, I mean, Truly. I, I'm not slagging on any of the, the Fantasia filmmakers and I would never call for censorship or anything like that, but it's completely normal for a lot of the horror films you guys have to show someone getting their head decapitated and bullet holes and, you know, their, their large esophagus is getting pulled out or whatever. But as soon as you show a male penis, all of a sudden it's absolutely like a crime against the state in America, you know? Yeah. And I feel like this is this is a this is a problem not only of censorship and filmmaking. It's a problem of morality, really. It's a problem of consciousness. This repression uh, leads to so many things, and uh, you know, so it, it was it was important to me. For, it, it was important for me to make a film where it was more like we're objectifying the man in a way, and and also. Um, I just wanted to get to the reality of things. Like I never have seen a movie that has dealt with masturbation in a realistic way. Masturbation is such a common experience for everybody. And it's, it's like not in the movies and the movies are where you shine a light on the most personal and revealing aspects of your soul. Why, why is masturbation not in the cinema? To a certain extent, I understand I mean, masturbation always in movies is played as two things. It's either like a joke, like um, it's a gag, like, Oh, Look at this guy it's pathetic and funny or it's played in like um crime tv like this guy is so disgusting that he would masturbate to, to this you know what i mean well what about the third way it is where it's just this this everyday thing that people do that's basically the same as brushing their teeth or checking their email i mean and not to mention the wait no you missed out on what i thought you were going to say which is a fourth and it's what your movie also does where it's like a romantic intimate moment yes yeah. yes yeah. Yes, you know that can be that too, and, and that it's both Scarlet and Jack. Yeah, you know? for and, sure. And that, and that is like the most for me. It's 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 a really sweet and romantic moment. I mean, that's a very it's more intimate than than maybe anything else. Well, it's about the body, and it's in in it's very rare. And letting someone into to the what like fully what who you are and what you like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, well, you're talking about this. Like to me, actually, the, the sexuality in this film is cerebral. It's not a, and not, it's not all about the body. Yeah. What is so hot and erotic about the connection between uh, Scarlett and Jack is that they're 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 able to tell each other what they're actually into, which I feel like most people in my generation are incapable of doing. And when they do that, it opens up the floodgates to all kinds of emotional things. But what, but what I was saying is, you know, um, you know, masturbation is about the body. It's where you can shut off this doubting sort of thing in your mind, which, you know, I, I'm sure during quarantine, everybody has to the nth degree. <laughs> it's holy in a sense. <laughs> Peter agrees. Yeah. No, no, I don't jerk off. Yeah, I don't know what you're Yeah. Um, I mean, but I think that that's what's so interesting too is that we like it's not just America, but like there's a there's a culture that is that implies morality on things that don't have it. Like a naked body is an it's not amoral; it's outside of morality. It just exists. Mm -hmm. But we have all these different points of view that are constantly like this is good, this is bad, this has sinful things no this is graceful when it's when I'm watching like private chat I feel like it's almost in between that where it's like 
this is not about the moral significance. It's more about the existence of it. And for some reason that is, sh it's shocking, not in a way that's like rejection. It's like, oh, I'm just not used to thinking outside of those yeah. kinds of opinions. Of, like, of the binary of like, this is a right or wrong mode. Yeah, yeah. pornography is either titillation or it's like disgusting in cinema, right? right? Yeah. So when it's just presented as, oh, this is just what these people are doing now. It's just a part of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, I've also, I just want to throw out there that anyone who's watching right now, there is the option to actually send questions uh, that I can receive. So feel free to do that at any point and I'll happily ask anything. <laughs> so uh, go ahead if that's what you have questions about. Um, I mean, one of the things you already mentioned him, but like to me, like I watched this and the first thing that comes to mind is Paul Schrader. Mm -hmm. Um, and you kind of have like, I'm like, obviously like you have American Gigolo, you have some of those like really hardcore 80s stuff too, but there's like shades of like first reformed in a really bizarre way. Like, I don't know if it's this like echoes of like despair and finding that kind of hope at the same time in a very twisted society. I'd love if you could kind of talk about that. Yeah. Paul Schrader is a, a hero of mine. I love Paul Schrader. I think first reformed is my favorite movie of the 21st century. It's an absolute beautiful movie. And it, it, it achieves what he actually has been trying to do since Taxi Driver, but has been maybe too too uh, worried about the marketplace to do since Taxi Driver, which is just actually make a transcendental film, which is a, fi a film where a, a character, a film truly about uh, truly about metaphysics. And my film is not that per se. My film is about a connection between people. It's not a holy film, but it, it, it is where my holiness lies is down in, in the, uh, what, whatever I want to express as a filmmaker is about people. And there's something about them in that motel room that to me has a sense of grace. It feels like there's an angel in that room. And it's, it's when these people are, are uh, at their most naked and vulnerable that they have nothing to lose. It's kind of like, it's kind of like that one Arthur Lee lyric on Forever Changes when he's, he says something like, you know, I like hypnotizing because when I'm hypnotized, I have no desire for power. Do you think, that, sorry, do you think you could actually work in that process with like, this is obviously the kind of films that you make are very, very indie. They're like on that next like notch below. Do you see yourself being able to create something within like a more structured and like I don't structure is not the wrong word but like a higher budget or bigger money that you could continue to have that kind of freedom well absolutely I'm young and, and filmmaking is not really a young person's game except for some outliers in cinema history and you know so all, all the films I made I would like to move up a notch in the ladder I never want to make a, a James Bond movie or a Star Wars movie but I would like to make a movie with a bigger budget and I, I have I have a good script for a, a, rom a, a romance, which will hopefully happen in the next uh, two years or so. You know, really, the kind of movies I want to make are, are movies that are romances. You could call them romantic comedies. Private Chat, in some weird way, is a romantic comedy because it has a comic sensibility and it's romantic. But romantic comedies that touch upon like the sordid aspects of human experience you know pri private chat was born of this seed of this idea crystallized in in this idea of the atm um which is why there's so many atm shots in the movie <laughs> which, which is which is that you know jack articulates it in the movie but it, it's this idea it's this really dark idea that people have when they're really depressed and i think social media and late capitalism exacerbates which is that all relationships you have are just networking opportunities and every single relationship you have, even between your mother and your own child is based on exploitation. Like what does this kid do for my personal brand? <laughs> it's pretty hard not to think like that under the, the, the current world we live in. And I think, you know, like, yeah, that question feels so important. That moment in the film, I mean, we were just watching it here and that moment where Jack asked, you know, speaks with Scarlett about that. And have you ever had an interaction that hasn't been exploitative? It really felt deeply of this moment of just a deep, we're all questioning everything. And I know that's very easy to say of like, oh, it's so of the moment, but I don't know. I mean, I just think, I think that's important. And 
yeah, that's that's deeply where where we're at, and that just really that just really struck me. I don't know. More money is always better, also. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, yeah. But there was a certain there's a certain freedom that you get with just having to make do with what you have, and 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 having a little bit of the challenge, I think, creates something really cool. I mean, Peter can speak to this. Like, you know, you just came over. It, one of the more collaborative experiences of my life. I mean, I think we all had autonomy to do what we wanted. And, and that kind of comes with a, not a lot of money. You know, you only have, we only had to answer for ourselves. I mean. Well, we're, we're in a unique moment in cinema history where you can make a movie this size for really cheap. I bet if you made this yeah. movie in 1980, it would cost, you know, $3 million or something like that. You could make this movie for you know fifty thousand dollars or something like that right and, oliver and <laughs> and and it's it so it, we're lucky in that way but you know it's it's um there's a trade-off i think one of the deep regrets that you get when you read um you know uh like paul paul schrader's interviews is that he had great artistic and spiritual ambitions but at the same time he wanted to work in hollywood so he had to make a lot of compromises but cinema is all about compromises i mean that's sort of part and parcel of, of what the medium is about. It, it's, it's a capitalistic, imperialistic medium. <clears throat> um, so I have a couple of questions slash comments uh, from the, the, the audience right now. So I have from Mike Vanderbilt. Um, this had to be one of the best, most honest and honest, God's, honest to God sexy depictions of kink on screen. How important was that? And how did you avoid the mistakes of other films that either play it for laughs or fucked up things done by fucked up characters. That, I love that. It's because you just put yourself in Jack's shoes and you put yourself in other situations that you've been in and you are aware of the cinema tropes. Um, I thought a lot about theory, film theory about sex and cinema and sex and cinema, for the most part, is either a stopgap in the, in the plot for a quick titillation and to let the audience know that we're about to be thrust into act three and our heroes are together, or it's played for a gross out or something like that. But to me, what I, I read this book about um, sex positivity in cinema. I know that sounds like a kind of something corny, but what, what, what this book actually taught me was that sex po positivity in cinema isn't, isn't even inherently moral per se. It's about showing a protagonist receiving pleasure and not feeling guilt over it. So for me, like when Scarlett is masturbating on the bed and Jack is kind of doming her for the first time, that scene was super important to me because it's showing that this, this uh, BDSM thing isn't just um, something edgy or crazy or wild or something to be laughed at. It's um, incredibly earnest and, you know, it's, it, it's, it's the way these characters are relating to each other, but it's also showing that Scarlett is getting pleasure from this. Mm -hmm. And I feel like um, it's difficult to, to talk about it, but it, in, to me, that is, that is a, a strange kind of cinematic feminism, which what I was going for, which is where you can show a woman receiving pleasure from being dominated, if that makes sense. I think it makes a lot of sense and it was a really great answer. Uh, so another question. Uh, what did producer Oliver David contribute to the editorial vision? That was an I, anonymous hmm. person. Uh, I mean, Ben actually moved into, into my place for a while, not to live, but just to edit while we were doing the edit for this, uh, which was pretty nice. We were working uh, next to each other for a while. Um, I'd like to pretend I kept a close eye on Ben, but it's pointless. Cool. Um, but we went, you know, I, I, I read the scripts as Ben was writing them since 2015 and give notes. And then while we're shooting, we talk a lot about where the films go in and cast in and then in the edit as well, just like watching scenes, watching cuts and just like talking about it and occasionally arguing extensively, but mostly just talking. I think we only had one or two big fights in five years. That's not bad. Yeah. Oliver is, um, he's very intellectual for a producer. 
So a lot of our conversations are not like, oh, why does this lens cost X amount of money? It's more about what does this mean for the, on the grand scheme of things? And that's, that's, that's actually what you really look for. Um, I guess, I guess it's what any, any person who makes anything, what they really want is someone to take them seriously, to take their ideas seriously. That's actually one of the first like times when we, we went to like the camera shop and we went through all the lenses together and we're just like, okay, we're going to shoot the entire fucking film on this one lens. <laughs> and that's why it has that like slow webcam feel into it. And it wasn't the lens we thought we were going to shoot on, but it just ended up being like, okay, like this is a production choice, but it's also a choice about like setting an aesthetic and what does that aesthetic mean and how will that read? Um, and we wanted that sense that like you were kind of watching the whole thing through that slightly distorted webcam widescreen. And I think that was like a strong choice to really like pay dividends throughout. Yeah. It, it's uh, it reminded me a lot of um, the, like that weird, that middle era of like contemporary Terrence Malick, where it's like the, the, the mm -hmm. lens almost is like the God's point of view because he's so like in that Catholic thing. Yeah. But like with yeah. a new perspective, it was like God from below. I love, I love, I love that you said that. I love, I love what 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 Terrence Malick has done uh, in, the, in the last decade. I think he's the best American filmmaker right now. Yeah, it's incredible. So we have like lots of questions now. It's great. Uh, so I have. Um, so this is actually I'm going to say this is a question, but I'm also going to add the fact that I got a couple of texts from people watching the movie that were also about the art and the paintings. So uh, this is for Catherine. The colors are amazing. Um, are you also a visual artist who did the art in the gallery? Um, yes, it is. I, I did. Um, I, I'm Caroline Kit Sheridan. Um, I'm an abstract painter and I have been my whole life. And I basically was connected with to Ben from through a mutual friend. And, you know, I read the script and I really loved it for all of the reasons we were just discussing. And then I was like, oh, and she's a painter. Like, I know a painter. Uh, me. Um, so yeah, those, those are all, um, it's all my work. My heart is like pounding because, you know, I can talk easily about film, but when it comes to like my actual artwork, I get nervous. Um, I also painted the backdrop um, and in the, in the theater scenes. And yeah, I mean, hot pink was, a color that we had talked about for Scarlett's cam room. So, you know, that was also, I, I tried to choose work of mine that felt similarly saturated. Um, Scarlett just, you know, feels like in, in her clothing too, it's just a, a little bit of a contrast to Jack's more muted palette. And um, luckily my own artistic uh, brain tend towards uh, bright colors, so. Well, it was you, a happy marriage. You're not telling me the most important thing that most of those paintings that Scarlett shows Jack, Kit painted those far. It's not like she painted those as like props for the movie. Those are like her own artworks that I yeah, chose. Yeah, yeah. Like this, I like this one. I like this one. Yeah, yeah. You came over mm -hmm. and looked yeah. at all of my work, and we chose those. Yeah, but those those were. I think there's a version of the film <laughs> in the script where you could have shown really bad paintings, and it would have been played for laughs. That he's so obsessed with these paintings, they have to be actually good paintings. So you're like, oh, okay, wow, this this cam girl actually is a painter. Wow, cool. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it you know, no uh, no visual artist doesn't have a day job. <laughs> I'll have to have uh, some way, but yeah, I'm I was I felt very lucky that uh, I had this opportunity too. I mean, the um, it's very close to my heart. The gallery art uh, with the videos. That was something I did with the character and uh, yeah. was one of the first things that me and Kit worked on together. I like, yeah. I took this uh, performance class in uh, college, which I didn't know what performance art was at the time. <laughs> I thought it was theater and it's very different type of uh, art medium. And I did this thing yeah. where I brought these uh, bread loaves uh, out on the floor and I stepped on them and I was like, this is like about you know, leaving a trace and impression <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> so then years later, I remember that. <laughs> and, yeah. and Ben's like, we need art. And I was like, oh, well, well, this is my character. And like, what would I do to make something that like is actually really ridiculous, but still works as an actual yeah. art project. And I remembered that and I was like, okay, 
this is something that came from a really real place. So I'm going to reuse this as like something to show my character uh, kind of just trying to like, I don't know, it's just a really funny I way. mean, yeah, I mean, I think it's both kind of on like too on the nose and actually it's so on the nose that it works. Yeah, yeah. it felt like being at a show when you were there. Like I really uh, just turned up and like, it was the fucking first day of shooting was our biggest day. That was our first day, yeah. Yeah, we got this <laughs> huge location and like, Kits like turned this thing into a fucking gallery out of yeah. Nikki's work. I was like, wow, we're in a gallery. This is yeah. cool. Like, I love when Buddy in the in the film goes like, you're gonna fuck up her bread, man. <laughs> <laughs> like, and gets in a fight with Peter and like. I mean, but but I mean, and I was worried that they would destroy the set. I'm like, you know, behind the camera, being like, oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> I mean, when, when Buddy fights Peter, that's real. That's very real. <laughs> Buddy was very angry that Peter took him down. Yeah. yeah. It was, there was a lot of tension. But, but, yeah. Buddy, Buddy showed up and uh, very late. And uh, I love Buddy. He's a great actor. But, you know, it was like we, he wasn't quite sure what we were going to film that day. So I was like, just like, I, I mean, the last time I had hung out with him, he had been uh, boxing me in his mom's basement and being like, come on, Ben, you, if you want to make a movie, you got to learn how to fight, <laughs> you know? And I was like, just do what you did to me. Just fight him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Have more questions. I uh, love the film and the ending is beautiful. Are there any ways in which you tried to avoid shooting scenes in the typical quote unquote male gaze? Yes and no, because I am a male, so I can never escape the male gaze. And I think an honest way to make films is to sort of embrace your male gaze. I think one, one of the big problems of contemporary cinema and well, of all 20th century cinema is that it's predominantly filmed from the male gaze. And it's like, so when you look back at like a film like Rear Window or something, just to use a textbook example, you don't want to say, oh, well, that movie's from the male gaze, so let's destroy it. What you want to say is, oh, in fact, the more complicated and more interesting answer is that the power of Rear Window is that it was filmed by someone who was self-conscious of their male gaze. And what the contemporary cinema needs is just a lot of people who don't film from the male gaze. We need other filmmakers to make movies now. In a way, it's like just not, you know, acknowledging that it's the male gaze and not kind of assuming that this is the universal way of seeing. right 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 it's like yeah yeah that, that's a good that's a good point so there's tons of movies being made now and i think we're going to see a watershed moment in the in in this century where non-male filmmakers are going to show their gazes and it's going to be wonderful and that's going to be the evolution of the cinema but i think when someone like me makes a movie you have to be honest about the pervert inside of you, if that makes sense. And you and you have to and you have to make movies from your point of view, but you also have to be aware of that point of view. So I wanted to show Jack earnestly, but also critique him and show Scarlett's perspective. That's why there's the flip halfway through the movie where you really see her perspective, which is when I think the movie really starts cooking. Um yeah, I was definitely very I was so conscious of the male gaze. In fact, um when we first started shooting, I hired a female cinematographer who I, I won't name because they don't want to be named. But I thought, well, for such a male gazy movie, it might be, and, and because I wanted this movie to be genuinely uh, sensual, not in a pornographic way, but in, in a cinematic way, I, I wanted to hire a woman. So I did, and uh, it just didn't work out. After like three days of shooting, I realized that they weren't very good at what they did. And it kind of taught, and it it, it it was very it was very dumb of me to hire someone that I didn't really know their work, and I really liked them on a personal level, but it just didn't work out. So I ended up saying, "Well, I'll just shoot this movie." And in some ways, for such a low budget movie, it's very easy for me to just throw the camera on my shoulder because I know what I want, you know. But I was super super conscious of 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 this of, of what we were doing, and I didn't want to just repeat what's been done in the past. There's Brian De Palma already. There's there's Hitchcock there's the entire body of Hitchcock already and I mean all films well, yeah I mean like, all when, popular when, when films. you when you use the word Hitchcock you're almost using a synecdoche for the word cinema so what you're doing when you talk about cinema is you're talking about men photographing women and art history yeah and art history 
What do you mean by that? I just, I mean, yeah. you know, we all know. Yeah. We all know. <laughs> Steve knows what I'm talking yeah. about. Yeah, I know. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, so I'm gonna. Uh, we have. A, I'm gonna synthesize it down to three questions left because I feel like it's getting late to the East Coast time. Uh, this is super fun though. So um, I have one question that is basically we are. There's no more new movies. There's no Marvel. There's nothing to watch. Um, does anyone here have any recommendations as to like in this like unique moment, aside from Fantasia, uh, what would you say people should be watching? You guys want to answer this? I have my own answer, but my own answer would be go back into the treasure trove. That is the 20th century. It's all out there and it's all available and it will never be exhausted. The past has never even passed. Godard said that. Go back and watch the classics. Study. People said the, the, the things filmmakers made in the 1920s are more relevant than the things being made now because the, the world that they filmed led to the world that is happening now. Oh, you read that on telephone. Okay, so that's if no one else, if no one else has anything else, I can move on to the yeah, next. How could, it, how could Oliver and I top that? Yeah. yeah. How could we top that? How could any of us top that? We we they're killing it. We we. I mean, you guys. Uh, I have a, I have a practical suggestion for that. If there's a, I just left New York. One of the things I miss about New York is the indie cinemas because there's so many of them and they're so fucking good. Um, and there's Screen Slate Daily, which is an email that tells you what's playing at all the repertoire cinemas. Yeah. And even if you're not in New York, you should read that fucking email and just watch those films. Because if you don't know the history, it'll be like, watch this, watch this, watch this. Yeah, it's yeah. legendary. John. And also, no, no, no. I mean, sorry to cut you off about the Screen Slate. Screen Slate's great. Everybody bookmark it right now. But I was going to plug Peter's movie. He made a feature two years ago that we already kind of mentioned earlier. It's, it's out available for streaming now. Assholes. It's 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 like a seemingly gross out movie, but it's actually in its own way like Private Chat, a tender movie, trend, dealing with serious issues. So if you haven't seen it, check it out. Yeah, I'm gonna plus one for ourselves too. That was a gem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Played this exact program at Fantasia in the underground program. Yeah, it was. I think it was the first year that, or the second year, because it's the, the underground is pretty new. So you were like one of the one of the inaugural films. So that's pretty exciting to hear that. Yeah, and it really worked out well for Peter. He got to move on to, you know, incredible projects <laughs> like this. <laughs> uh, so the next question, I'm gonna combine two questions from. Wait, 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 from, wait, wait, yeah, wait, wait, I'm sorry. <laughs> can we backtrack? You are a curator, so you know more than we do. What films should people be watching right now? I mean, I hate telling people what to watch because I always like things that make people mad. So uh, yeah, yeah. I would say, like, I think that going back to the past is a great way of doing things. And right now you have things like Mubi and Criterion Channel that you can just like put on some random thing. Yeah. I would say watch short movies, like watch shorts. Like no one takes yeah. the time to do that. This is the moment. That's the future of cinema. These are going to be the artists. And when we're talking about filmmakers who do things that are outside of the box, you can't get more outside of the box than the person who's like, I only have time. I only have like 10 minutes, you know? Like sometimes you see the craziest things. Like less blank films, the documentaries is what I've been watching on Criterion. Those are incredible. Some of them are just 10 minutes. Some of them are half an hour. Like you can't go wrong. Uh, yeah. That's what I would say. Yeah, watch that. Yeah. Um, so anonymous slash Robert Brink. Uh, we're gonna have a question that is, Ben, why is all the acting with all caps so good? It's pretty unusual for an indie film and then other part uh yes ben tell the audience about that awesome guy who plays buddy so i'm gonna put that in one question um hi robert well i, I think i i think partially you know there's the old adage that 90 percent of directing is casting and it, it's not even like a cliche it's just totally true and um we lucked out in, in peter and julia and my friend kevin who plays the the painter character and, and Buddy and and Nikki, of course. You, 
Most and Keith Paulson. Yeah, and Keith Paulson, of course. Mm -hmm. People in this movie are more or less playing themselves. Not themselves. Ah, they, they, no. <laughs> they, 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 they do things that they're, they wouldn't do in their normal life. But I feel like, you know, like I spent some time with Julia when I was getting to know her. And I thought, you know, like, for example, when she says, um, when Jack says, how did you get into doming? And she said, well, ever since I was a kid, I've been a dom. And I used to fall around kids and ride them like ponies and this and that. That's something Julia actually said to me the first time we met. And was, that's just that's stuff like that is better than anything you could ever write. So when um, it's just built into my process that I, when when you cast somebody, you change your script so it's going to fit their world, and it's gonna it works inside your fiction. Julia is not playing herself; she's playing a fictional character, but she, she in some ways playing a character who is more naive than she is, mm -hmm. but she's embodying a, a part of herself that she understands and you allow her to do that. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I also like Kevin and buddy together. Yeah. yeah I mean, that scene with, with you, Peter, the three of you um, getting high and talking about gambling is one of my, you know, talking about making money for Kevin's son is one of my favorite scenes yeah. in the whole movie. Cause I mean, that was real chemistry. I mean, you guys, it, it, yeah. it was so collaborative. You guys there's like a thing about Ben's process where it's like, there's not a lot of time for lights. There's not a lot of time for nothing's on a dolly. Nothing's on a crane, nothing's set up. It's just like, we're just going to do some acting and we're going to film acting and we're going to keep doing the acting. And it's just like, so performance heavy and it shows and it pays dividends. I think cause like you end up with something that's compelling and people tolerate a little grittiness in the imagery. Yeah, I mean, and, and Peter, since he's here, I'm going to blow a little smoke his way, is an in, incredible actor who is willing to be way more vulnerable than anybody else is. Almost everybody who auditioned for Jack beforehand, I would say, okay, in this movie, you know, you're going to have to do X, Y, and Z. What do you think about that? And almost everybody was like, I'm an actor. You know, I, I stand on my mark and I say my lines. Peter's not that way. It's my. Uh, this is why... Peter's one of the geniuses of the, 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 our, our American indie cinema is that he's willing to, to do anything. He's really brave and he shows that in his own film and he did that for us. Uh, because I, I think one of the things that our cinema does that cinema indie cinema hasn't even done in the past is that it's more diaryistic. It's more just like, this is me right now in my apartment, and this is real. I and, and I think it has a lot to do with our generation. We're used to hanging, we're used to we're used to social media where everything is performance based anyway. But we, you know, we, we we amplify it. Thank you, Ben. That's sweet of you to say. <laughs> oh come on! Don't be blushing now. <laughs> when when should this is when I blush, Oliver? <laughs> this is your cue. I blushed yeah. at the Q&A. <laughs> yeah. I think one of the best things was your uh, relationship with Peter. I think, Peter, you weren't afraid to, like, challenge Ben, uh, particularly in the beginning, and you guys got Sorry. your flow. But I, <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you were like, no, this is not how Jack would say this. And then, like, go off on, like, a 20-minute, like, uh, dialogue that you kind of riffed on. And then Ben would be like, Actually, I like this part of the dialogue. Why don't we do it again, but with this? And I feel like that was one of the most important part to Jack and, and your directing and like and how you got the performance was like there was a mutual uh, argumentativeness that you both thrived on. Well, I mean, like, yeah, the movie was heavily scripted, but most of the dialogue in the movie was a paraphrasing of the script. And right. I never really made a movie like that before. And right. I knew I, I wanted to this time. And I have to thank Peter a lot for helping me get to that because any, any t Peter refuses to do anything that's phony if he shows up to the set and I'm like all right just stand here and just like say this line or whatever he, he will refuse to do it like there is no way I'm doing that because it's so phony and I love that actually because it's it's uh when you're focused so much on something else um you got him to do the snow globe though he thought that was funny Right. Yeah. So I gave in a couple times. I think it's funny. You're reminding me that I was a little difficult. Uh, well, I'm now I'm like, Shit, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that was true. It, was like, it seems like you just felt free to speak your mind. You know, I mean, were yeah. you difficult? I know. I never felt like that. 
Well, no, I'm hoping I don't come I off. I didn't say that. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's true. No, I, I, no, difficult's my word, not yours. But I think, no, I, all those moments were very productive. Yes, they were. Truly. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to ask one more question, um, which is also a comment, which uh, is, uh, I love hearing Ben speak about the Paul Schrader influence. Two other filmmakers, point of view, uh, private chat also brought to mind is the early New York films of Abel Ferreira uh, and especially Larry Fessenden's 1995 film Habit. I was wondering if these films were influences as well. I love also, I just want to point out that I think that like, as far as like part of a New York film legacy, like it does feel like a natural continuation of those movies. So like, I think that's a great question comment. Uh, no, I mean, th those filmmakers weren't self-conscious on my mind. When, when I was making the film, the, the, the big films I was thinking about was Fallen Angels, the Wong Kar Wai movie, which is not, the subject matter isn't anything about uh, private chat, but it, it, uh, the whole movie has that wide angle lens in an urban environment. And it kind of- uh, That film's a whole film about alienation and urban about, separation. Like it's so private chat. Sure, sure, sure. It, it is on an emotional sense, but maybe I'm like a not obvious narrative sense. But yeah, it's a movie about, it's a very romantic movie about alienation in the city for sure. So I had that on my mind, a, a huge one for me, which anytime we're talking about Paul Schrader's obvious was pickpocket actually. An earlier version of the movie was, was going to have Peter be far less sympathetic and be like a very pickpocket s narrator, which I guess goes back to Dostoevsky. It's, it's about a character who has a, um, in some ways it's a morality play, even though the movie doesn't tell you this is how you should think about these characters, but it's, it's asking you to think about an issue, which is also what pickpocket does. No, I, I wasn't thinking about those filmmakers, um, but I do love their films and I'm flattered that you saw the connection. I, um, it is such a New York film. I sort of miss, sort of tonight made me miss New York. We are here in Brooklyn, um, but there's a, like, you know, all of the stuff in Chinatown, you know, it's. Yeah, I mean, part, part of it's like, so how do you make a movie about two people on webcams? Cinematic, right? Yeah. It's, like a, it's like a pretty tough question. And so for me, it was like, well, you need to, in almost this Terrence Malick way, you need to experience the material reality of what your fingers on a keyboard feels like. So that means you need, the camera needs to be like studying your touch. And it needs to actually deal with screen captures of things, but not in a pedantic way. I mean, also, I mean, this brings me to uh, my, uh, this is where my brain's going with the title cards in the movie where the, they're almost like silent movie style title cards that tell you the text messages. To me, um, that's how I experience texts and emails when I get them. They're, when texts and emails come your way, they're so um, uh, monopolizing your brain power that all your physical surroundings go away. And even if you're just like walking down the street, you're not paying attention walking down the street, you're just like in that thought. So that very old movie technique felt suddenly really relevant to me again yeah. to show how thinking actually works in the digital age. Um, I mean, I, I think that's partially comes from Godard as well. I just love the way he uses titles in his movies. It feels very like the, the filmmaker um, is doing what a novelist can do by saying like, here's a chapter break, pay attention. You know you what mean, I mean? You mean like, yeah. like C stream? Like, oh, you know. look at that. <laughs> yeah, look yeah. at that, look at what I did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'd like to thank you all for like this amazing Q and A and this incredible movie. Um, I'm amazed that we've been talking for an hour and basically everyone stayed the entire time. Like uh, that is incredible. It's a week. Oh, it's not a week, but I don't know <laughs> what I'm saying anymore. Um, but if you're still here, there is a second screening. Tell your friends, and you could also this is going to be on YouTube that people can go watch. So you could send this to them as well. Um, I love this movie and I so happy you guys all showed up to talk uh for so long um i don't know if you want to have any closing remarks uh go right ahead uh i'm i'm listening yeah it's up to you. I would, uh, the, the final the final thing i would say is thank you guys for tuning in and don't treat the cinema like it's anything holy it's just another image and if you want to talk over it if you want to text over it 
do whatever you, if you want to remix it, do whatever you want to do. And, I, and very last point I'll make is if any filmmakers have any questions about the budget, how we did things on a practical level, you can find my email very quickly. And I'm, I'll be uh, oh, no. very, very supportive because I, I do have a, a passion for people that are making underground personal movies and I will help you. So please help me. <laughs> Write to me. And you can do it. Can yeah. do it we yeah. did it if us idiots can do it you can do Total. it yeah i love that thank you guys so much again um i think we're gonna i don't know how 